The next speaker, um, he's from Peltarian, and he's the CEO, and uh, AI is Peltarian's core business, and uh, I'd like to give a warm welcome to uh, Luca Cedrovic Fries. You're with us here in real life. Thank you. Oh, I, I just have to take a photo of this, of a conference in Corona time. <laughs> That's too good. All right, <coughs> so uh, my name is Luka Senkovic Fris. I'm the CEO of uh, Peltarium. And basically what we are doing is we're trying to radically lower the price of deploying AI. And with AI, I don't mean um, the lot of older technologies that are being rebranded as AI. I'm talking about the really cutting edge stuff, deep learning, that has been really propelling the AI boost that we've seen in the past few years. And what we've seen historically with our other technologies is when you seriously reduce the cost, it's when, that, when magic happens. And basically, we want to make sure that AI can be used everywhere and really supercharge everything. Our way of accomplishing this is we're building a, an enabler, which is a cloud-based platform that allows non-data scientists uh, to build cutting-edge systems and put them into production. So basically making the technology far more accessible, uh, but without taking, uh, sort of simplifying it too much in terms of its power. We're not technically a startup. Founded in uh, 2004, uh, it was me and my co-founder Mons. And we had a product called Synapse, which was a development environment for neural nets. And uh, we had some 300 companies using it, uh, 10,000 users or so. And then by 2016, it was still just the two of us, and uh, the market was really taking off, and we decided, okay, now, now's the time to scale this. And uh, we got EQT, and then the Wallenbergs on board, and later uh, Euclidean Capital. And it's, they came on board because there is a, right now a big opportunity in the market uh, where the global tech giants and China are completely dominant within AI when it comes to algorithms, so coming up with new stuff there. Uh, Europe is vastly behind, Sweden is vastly behind. But we really do have a chance of building a global tech giant out of Europe, taking a lead in technology. And if you look back historically, take the Industrial Revolution, it wasn't really the steam engine itself that sort of propelled it, that scaled steam technology. It was when the machine tooling for building steam engines uh, be uh, became available and very cheap. So generally, uh, most companies are in s one way or another in an, uh, uh, trying to get some AI, get uh, digitalized, get, uh, get ready for the AI first world. And most are doing it in a wrong way that tends to be super expensive, and that's because they tend to confuse AI and analytics. Uh, two vastly different things. So if you look at AI and, or sorry, analytics and big data, it's all about centralizing all the information in the company, piping it through a data science department that does the interpretation and outcomes some sort of actionable intelligence, information on how your business uh, does, forecast, and so on. And this is super important, but it's also very, very difficult and a very long process. So centralizing all of your data, uh, that's, I've seen no company that's had an easy way of that, especially the more traditional ones. So AI, on the other hand, AI does not provide insights. It provides a concrete solution, either by optimizing something so you can cut costs, or that you can create new services. And it works best when it's distributed. AI works when it's put into the hands of the domain experts, rather than 
into the hands of generic uh, domain uh, data centers. You can imagine, uh, say, an uh, antenna developer at Ericsson who's been working there for 30 years de developing antennas, that there's some newly graduated 20-year-old data scientist comes from a central department and say, oh, you're building antennas. Can I be of some assistance? Would you like some AI? It, it, it simply doesn't work. The sort of do domain knowledge is the difficult bit. The AI isn't really. But there are two major obstacles today towards this really getting into the hands of the domain experts. And one is that it's very hard to find uh, people. And the second one is that it's, uh, the technology is based for research. Now, if you look at the sort of data science part, the, the road that uh, most companies are uh, taking, is that the cost of uh, finding a mediocre data scientist is hard. Finding a good AI expert, that's nearly impossible. That's almost reserved for um, the big tech giants. And if you look at the sort of gap between availability and demand, this is a report from uh, IBM and Kaggle that showed that there were uh, what they qualified as 35,000 data scientists with the uh, sort of modern skills in the US, while there was a need for about 700,000. So this skill gap equation doesn't work. The second thing is, when most people have the conception of AI, how you build an AI system, is that you get some data, you build a model, train it, then you analyze the result, possibly you repeat a bit, and that's it. But that's not reality. Reality is sort of this piece of building the model and training it. It's really, really a tiny bit of it all. So the, the whole process involves everything from uh, configuring different uh, toolkits to data management, version controlling experiments, serving infrastructure, monitoring, and so on. So there's a lot around it. And the way that most try to solve it today is by using a ton of different tools for each of these sort of steps. And those that succeed, and there are a few, relatively few that do. They end up with something that's not scalable, it's not maintainable, and it really requires a very high level expertise, both on the software engineering side, DevOps side, and data scientist side. Now, so what's, what's the alternative? And this is uh, uh, where we're coming now. Um, the world today, AI world, uh, the tooling provided by the tech giants and that exist in the market are usually typically divided into sort of two very broad categories. One is the super powerful tools like uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, or here we have Amazon SageMaker, where you can do a lot. You can solve almost any modern AI problem with it, but it requires expertise and it's built for research rather than production. And then, then at the other end of the spectrum, and I'm gonna skip them, uh, discussing them more in detail because they're not really not relevant, are the sort of auto AI or auto MLs. Super simplified, where in theory you press one button and out pops uh, an AI model. The problem is that it doesn't work that way. Uh, building an AI model is, uh, still requires a bunch of iteration. You have to have your own data, you have to have support for many types of data and so on. So are, those are most for toy problems. So you have the choice today of either going by uh, something that requires expertise that you can get or something that really doesn't work. But comparing the sort of more powerful system, so I'm going to show you a video of a person using uh, Amazon SageMaker, a PhD in machine learning, certified on AWS. And on the right side is of our platform. It's one of our tech writers who did that. Familiar with the platform, but um, an engineer by education, so not, not a data scientist. And the, the challenge of the problem, relatively simple. Uh, so you have some images of car damage and some tabular data that says which manufacturing year and things like that. 
and they were to build a model that classifies the damage based on the image and on that metadata. Now, you don't have to understand really what goes on in the screen, but it's more of a, like the, the difference of what you see. Let's see if we can get the video going. Mm. Oops. Hmm. No? Hmm. Well, that's a pity. Okay. I, I'll just uh, narrate what, <laughs> what happens in the video, although it's slightly le less effectful. Uh, so basically, when we have a combination of images and tabular data, uh, the a person using AWS wrote tons of code uh, for an hour and didn't get the first version to work. On our platform, it was done in like four minutes. And then, then sort of a follow-up was ju just to use image data because they had trouble on, on the Amazon side. Um, and it took like two minutes on our platform. It took an hour on the other. And what you ended up there is... Uh, yeah, still doesn't work. What you ended one, uh, up in one case is a, is a lot of spaghetti code that really can't be put into production. Uh, and uh, losing a bit the point when you didn't see the video, but uh, what, what, uh, there is a, like a vast, vast difference. There's an order of magnitude of uh, speed, and in one case you can actually just put it into production. In the other case, you would have to um, have a big team of DevOps and so on to get into shape for production. And this is actually, uh, and we, we, have a, we have a very good relationship with uh, both uh, uh, Google and Microsoft, and we have, uh, we have deep collaborations with them, so we've uh, both technological and uh, otherwise, and we've got it validated now over and, ah, look at that. It works. So you can see now it's it's fast forwarded. You can see the platform here, the graphical platform. Well, this is the code. It's very low res. It's actually done on the right side. This was just calling the model. So, and then we had the second case, which was we simplified it for the AWS uh, sake, and they were allowed to reuse all of their code. And this was done like in two minutes or something, three minutes, while, yeah, they got it to work, but it took about an hour. And when you would have to do it again, it would take an hour again, so it, it's uh, it, it's not just a one thing. Can we get back to the presentation? Thanks. But this this is a so sort of what we have validated so far is that o although uh, we are seriously behind in Europe and Sweden when it comes to algorithms, uh, sort of all of the really awesome things happening in AI are happening are coming from the US and with China as a second, and Europe far, far, far behind. But where we do have, where we are world class, where we do actually have a chance of establishing a meaningful leadership, it is in tooling around AI. And hopefully eventually we'll also catch up on the other side. So this was a bit of, of theory. Uh, a couple of, uh, let me see how, to, oh, we're doing good. Uh, a couple of examples uh, of practical customer cases, so, so you get an idea of how this is uh, can be used. Uh, Ericsson, so they answer a lot of RFPs, like 5,000 per year, and they have 500 people sitting in India doing that semi-manually. And they have a department in Sweden uh, that uh, double checks the, those results. Uh, they were able to automate most of that now with AI, and uh, it meant uh, 10 million per year saving 15x RI the first year. 
completely different end of the spectrum. Sybase, small Swedish company, uh, has a, creates a med uh, probe that was originally used for melanoma detection. And they had this idea like, okay, should, if, if we add images to that and use AI, can we uh, get better results? And they were a really early platform customer and then um, they, they got, got some results, but they weren't great. Uh, they were a bit better what they had, but nothing that really justified of going in and sort of getting new FDA approval and things like that. And then uh, about a year from when they started using our platform, we had a meeting and we, we were pretty sure like this is a churn, but they seemed pretty happy. And they said, yeah, the melanoma thing, uh, we stopped working on that, but we, we found a different use case. So there is a membrane in the skin that protects uh, the body from things getting in things that shouldn't be there. And basically, the quality of that varies for some reason over time. And when it's weak, then people with allergies get eczema and things like that, rashes. Uh, and the only way to measure that has been to do a biopsy. And you had to do it on uh, skin where there was a rash. But using their, their probe in our platform, they built a model where they could on clear skin detect way ahead when that membrane quality was going down. And basically, they, uh, this became a very important part of their business. So they're focusing a lot on, uh, on that now. Why I love this example is because uh, so we at Peltarion know AI, know absolutely nothing about skin. We didn't know there was a membrane. Uh, while at the same time, so, so we couldn't have come up with this use case. While at the same time, they couldn't have done it without our platform because they're medical engineers. They're, they're not data scientists. And then as that meeting was, uh, was ending, they said, oh yeah, we have a, we have a second, uh, second thing in production. Uh, over the summer, the, um, uh, we looked at our uh, quality control. So they basically have a, each of these probes, the tips, tip is controlled by somebody looking in a microscope and seeing that there are no defects. And over the summer, an intern, who was the CFO's daughter, uh, built a model, they bought a video microscope, and she built, built a model to pre uh, uh, predict these uh, quality variations. And they were able to automate that step fully. So, Sybase, uh, fantastic company. Uh, Electa, brain tumor segmentation. Uh, as good as the best doctors in the world, and there's a massive shortage. Um, typically, today, uh, the, the treatment when you have a brain tumor, the first thing you want to do is radiation therapy. But the cues are super long, so between diagnosis and the radiation therapy, the tumor moves very often, and they end up irradiating the wrong place in the brain, which is bad. Uh, so, uh, being able to uh, sp speed this process up and automate it, uh, like a, they want to put this in actual machines so they can do uh, radiotherapy at the same time, see it's sort of a real-time view of the tumor. Pretty cool tech. Epidemic sound. Mm, so, uh, they built a model that classifies music by mood. It was a part of their re recommender system. Again, a great example of, at that time, they didn't have any data scientists, so there was just a bunch of their developers that were able to build this using our platform. Billerud Koshner, optimizing paper quality, um, so it's uh, classifying what type of, how you should process different pulp, depending on the quality of the pulp. Husqvarna, floor grinders. So basically, uh, when you, with these industrial floor, floor grinders, there are very few experts, actually. In Sweden, there's only a couple who you know how to operate these because they hear on the sound whether they should apply more pressure or less pressure or uh, if something is wrong and so on. Uh, so uh, we helped Huskorn out there. So they put up uh, microphones on those, uh, collected data, and then built a model that could actually predict it as good as experts, meaning that you could get novice users to operate one of these uh, big machines uh, almost as well as the experts. Ipsos, Ipsos, that it's a marketing research company. 
So uh, basically, traditionally, what they've done is uh, when they have a product to review, they've brought people into the office and um, interviewed them while having a psychologist look, looking at them and writing down sort of the emotions. Uh, we help them aut automate this with uh, a neural net that recognizes emotions, so this can done, be done remotely. It meant a lot to them now uh, during the corona thing. Uh, pandemic in the in the spring. Uh, another example uh, of, of Ipsos is slightly related to the Ericsson case I mentioned earlier. So one of the really cool things in AI that has happened in the past two years is text understanding. Basically, AI that can understand text on a semantic level. So it doesn't. It you can have two sentences that don't have a word in common but mean the same thing, and the AI will understand that. And to kick it off, it works with any language. So apparently there's a semantic level that's universal for any language. So what we did there was the, they, they get a lot of surveys they, where they get, have free text. And before they had translators and a lot of manual processing, and we were able to automate that. So going from free text in basically any language to quantified numbers and things like that. So that was what all I had. I just want to give you a, like a feeling of what's happening in this area and what we are working on. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Please stay. I have one question for yes. you from, from, from the viewers. Is Sweden doing enough to advance AI research and development at universities and institutes? Are programs such as WASP being enough? No. I mean, it's, it's great that we have those, but... Mm -hmm. uh, those are all coming from the private sector. I think there, sh there, there should be a more of an effort uh, to invest in that. Mm -hmm. Let's take one more. Um, about scalability. How scalable is, is the Peltarium platform? Well, that's, that's its primary point, that it is super scalable. You can go from uh, a couple of people using a model to millions. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really not a problem from no. your perspective. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming and sharing your, your presentation with us. Thank you. Thank you.